Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to Swayam Prabha DTH 16 channel. My name is Ariba Shabbir and we are going to learn English language teaching. This course contains 20 lectures and it comes in different modules. So, it uh, is in accordance with the UGC guidelines and the lectures can benefit the students who are pursuing B English, B Honours English and B Honours Communicative English. Besides, it contains a comprehensive view of the syllabus which facilitates a core foundation of English language teaching. As this paper is wide ranging, being informed by research covering psycholinguistics, sociolinguistics, education, corpus linguistics, cognitive linguistics and other areas of the cognition, learning and information sciences, the ultimate goal is to influence the quality of language education. And we also aim to inform the learners disseminating relevant research. Now, we will look up at the lectures that we will cover up in the upcoming sessions. So, in the first uh, lecture, we will discuss English language in India status and prospects. This is going to be an introductory session and in this session, the learners will be enlightened with a brief history of English language in India, such as English in pre-independence and post-independence periods. Further, the role of the English language will also be discussed in the time of industrialization and globalization. Moreover, its status as second language and foreign language will be discussed as per the directives given by the government of India. And this uh, session will also focus on the importance and prospects of learning and teaching in the present context. The second session will cover the introduction to English language with respect to world Englishes, received pronunciation and general Indian English and its varieties. So, learners will be able to critically analyze the range and variety of traditions and approaches to the study of English language. They will be introduced with the idea of these important uh, dialects that are there and they will also be introduced with the concept that prepares the language learners to learn and acquire the second language. Besides, we will learn the structures of the English language teaching and this uh, module will come in three ways. At first, we will discuss the phonology. So, this lecture will include all the major components of phonology and you will be able to understand with the respect to the second learner's development and the effective pronunciation and you will be analyzing the meaningful communication among individuals which took place in light of their pronunciation and uh, different aspects of the vocal um, support. The fourth lecture comprises of structures of the English language teaching which will include morphology. So, this lecture will incorporate uh, the second language learners understanding with regard to the vocabulary acquisition and the uh, word uh, uh, makeup uh, and also its uh, uh, meaning with respect to deviation, clipping, inflection and so on. In the fifth lecture, you will talk uh, about uh, syntax and semantics and we will be discussing a range of sentences which reflects that sentences uh, are syntactically and semantically valuable. In the sixth lecture, we will discuss understanding context in second language learning. So, a detailed discussion will be there which will connect you with the sounds, words, expressions utterances, situations, people and their personal experiences. In the seventh lecture, you will get to know about the learners and uh, it will include several aspects of language learning that helps a learner to go through the learning process that includes psych psychological, social and emotional perspective of students. In the eighth lecture, you will learn about the older and young learners 
and this will provide a detailed awareness of context and practical suggestions of a wide range of learners who encompass a variety of cultures coming from different backgrounds and also they are aligned to different situations. In addition, educators will be able to understand the difference between teaching and uh, learning as well as the uh, two scenarios with respect to the old and young learners and the emphasis will be given on the demographic information such as gender, age, ethnicity, location, etc. and learners characteristics such as styles and preferences. In the ninth lecture, we will get to know about the methods of English language and this will be another module. In this module, we will cover grammar translation method and direct method at first place. So, uh, these two methods are the older one and they are quite relevant when it comes to teaching grammar and the, you will be enlightened that how these two approaches came into second language learning pedagogy and what were the scopes of improvement. In the 10th lecture, we will mainly discuss the audio lingual method and total physical response uh, method. So, uh, the, these methods preceded the uh, grammar translation and direct method and you will also know about its prospects. In the 11th lecture, we will mainly discuss about the communicative language teaching and blended method of teaching. These are the modern approaches and these were produced after the uh, structural uh, notional approaches of teaching language. And then uh, we will uh, discuss task based, content based and participatory approaches in teaching second language. This will be the 12th uh, session and this will give another reflection of how to teach language in a context. Now, coming on to the 13th lecture, we will discuss teaching of language, but through literature. So, this will give another dimension of our language learning and teaching and here we will talk on language based, paraphrastic based and information based approaches. In addition, in the 14th lecture, we will mainly be discussing the personal response based, moral philosophical based and stylistic based approaches. In the 15th lecture, we will mainly talk about the theories of language learning and acquisition. So, what are the theories that we will be talking about? It will be Pavlov's theory of classical conditioning, Skinner's behaviorist theory and also we will talk about the operant conditioning. Then we will uh, discuss the Stephen Krashen's theory of second language and learning and then we will also talk about the Chomsky's universal grammar and it is quite famous as far as the language learning is concerned. After the 15th session, we will learn the needs analysis and uh, we will get to know its role and importance in preparing material. So, we will consider the learners information with regard to their demography and then we will prepare a kind of uh, um, a profile which will help us to guide our learners. In the 17th lecture, we will mainly discuss the assessment in second language learning. So, this module will mainly focus on the assessment part and uh, the assessment in second language learning will be the introductory of it and the 18th lecture will comprise of the other three important concepts that are important in language learning and teaching and that is self assessment, portfolio assessment and reflection. In the 19th lecture, we will mainly focus on technology part. So, at first we will mainly discuss technology in language teaching. We will focus on call computer based instructions that is CBI, computer based education, computer mediated communication and so on. And in the 20th lecture, we will uh, go through the important concept and uh, details of uh, implementing computer assisted language learning and information and communication technology. Now, dear learners, let us try to look up at the new important thing and this important uh, perspective is not consigned to teaching and learning pedagogy, but it is mainly reflected on how English language came into existence when we talk about India. So, I am going to first discuss about English language in India status and prospects 
and after this session you will be able to develop an understanding of English through the lens of three important perspectives. At first, we will discuss the economic, social and political life of the people of the country and how the English was playing an important role. The second important uh, concern that to mention over here is that you will be able to analyze the prospects of English language teaching in India and also its learning. The third would be that learn India's long uh, association. And uh, as you know, we will uh, talk about uh, the uh, English language in India. So, we will start from pre-independence period, then we will take it to the post-independence period and then also we will be discussing about the present period uh, which is taking English language as its main component of living life. The fourth point as it is mentioned over here, you will be able to uh, avail your learners the importance, need and role of English language in different domains such as science, technology, arts and social science, business, trade and commerce. So, you will be able to come across with a number of uh, situations where English has played a significant role. Now, this particular presentation comprises of uh, number of points. And at first, you will get to know about English language in India. At second, you will get to know about the status of English in the pre-independence period and how it was introduced during this uh, time. At the third uh, part, you will get to know about the role of English language in the post-independence uh, period that is after the 1947 when India got independence. So, how English came into being and uh, what is its status now. So, you will also be able to learn the three language formula which resolves the conflict of uh, learning and acquiring language. Then we will talk about the medium of instruction which is widely uh, used in India and, and then we will talk about the medium of instruction which is widely used in India. The other important uh, content includes the future prospects of English in India. So, we will cover up these important points in this session. I am now going to discuss about the role and composition of English in India. So, let me tell you that uh, whenever you go to any company or organization or school or institute, you first uh, are tested uh, that uh, your communication is good enough or not and then you are tested about the language proficiency. You know, English is playing a significant role. If people are coming from diverse backgrounds, they have one connecting language and that is English. And that is one of the reasons why English is considered as a priority. So, English for job is important and that is, is the scope uh, which is uh, quite prevalent. The second important thing is English for social inter interaction. So, not just for uh, the professional uh, network, but also for your personal endeavors like if you are meeting uh, people and you are coming across with different cultures, uh, varying backgrounds, you need to think of connection and that connection will be established by English because English is widely accepted in the world and therefore, it is mentioned that English is in India is especially used for social interaction. If you are belonging for, uh, in Kashmir and you want to connect somebody who is sitting in Odisha, you might not be knowing each other's languages and vice versa. So, uh, what would make you connected? It would be the English language and therefore, English is important for academic purpose, for job purpose, for social interaction, for knowing each other, for, for, for crossing all the barriers that occur in any pedagogy. And then we have English for trade and commerce. So, our commerce, our uh, uh, trade is not consigned to only our country, also not uh, to our particular region, but it is expanded to multinationalities. Uh, we can uh, now do business across uh, di uh, different countries. So, what is the component that is required? I am sure your answer is that the English language would help you to facilitate the idea to hire people from different organizations, to get to know about the people from different countries and also do 
do investments uh, in a variety of uh, um, uh, in a variety of situations. Now, the fourth point as it is mentioned over here English for higher education and research. So, the language which is used for science and technology, trade and commerce, for research, for everything you need to learn English language in order to pursue it. And because it is a medium of instruction, also because all the materials and the prospects which are available are in English. So, English has uh, taken a major role in making you uh, close to uh, education. The other point which says is that a must know language. So, all these points like English for job, English for social interaction, English for trade and commerce, English for higher education and research will comprise and will make you uh, uh, a person who should know and must know English language. Therefore, English is basically um, a language which will help you in prospering and it will bring economic prosperity. Coming on to the next slide, it is mentioned that in English in pre-independence period. So, uh, as you know that uh, India was invaded by the Britishers and the first uh, um, world war that took place was in 1857. And uh, before the 1857, English was quite prevalent. In fact, it was also uh, there after that period, but uh, the intention of introducing into uh, Eng India was not merely that uh, uh, Indians would get effective education, but also to rule them, so that they can get to know about uh, the norms of the Britishers, they would be aligned to the working uh, potentialities of the British system and also, so, uh, so that uh, uh, the, the Britishers could guide them in a, in a way. So, a media uh, so, a medium was taking place and this medium was occurring in the form of English language. Like you see in this slide, Timothy J. Sc uh, Scras in 2004 explains the growth of English in India in the following words. Since the days of the British Raj, India remained the language of domination. So, it was mainly used to dominate the Indians and um, uh, their status and privilege in India. The hegemonic uh, colonial project in India was to create and maintain a class of administrative officers, clerks and compliant civil servants to carry out the task of ruling the vast and expensive subcontinent. So, you know that British came to India with the establishment of the East India Company in 1600 and by 1900 uh, practically all the institutions of higher education used English as the medium of instruction and aimed at the spread of western knowledge and science. So, several translation projects were taken up to graft the European knowledge on the native language in order to produce textbooks in various subjects such as history, geography, physics, chemistry etcetera and these were used regularly in schools. Uh, this seems to be the idea of introducing westernized education. However, uh, there was also a point of uh, introducing English with respect to uh, dominating India in varying uh, domains. Now, coming on to the uh, second slide, it says that the impact of the English language took place uh, on India in varying capacities and this is widely discussed by Professor Nitin Bhatnagar in 2021. He says that English led psycho-cultural impacts on common Indians. Why? Because uh, Indians were accustomed to using their own language in their uh, schools and uh, they were quite proud of it. But with the introduction of the English language in their classrooms, in their educational institutions, they felt quite oppressive and they were not ready to submit their language and culture in, in an easy way. So, there was a psycho-cultural impact that was commonly observed at that time and there was a little conflict also that was emerging into a bigger conflict and uh, this psycho-cultural impact brought uh, 
uh, uh, identity crisis among the learners. So, let us see what uh, other things uh, uh, that uh, Professor Bhatnagar has mentioned. He says that an emergence of cultural divide was also observed. So, there were people who are following English language and its culture, but a great mass was also uh, following uh, their own culture and they were not ready to get ruled by the uh, English invaders. The psychology of a common man was adversely affected. So, because the culture was getting compromised and uh, the English language was introduced um, as something which is uh, dominating over their identities. So, it somehow prevented them from representing their own self and therefore, it resulted in the uh, psychology uh, and of a common man which was getting adversely affected. Then uh, Professor Bhatnagar says that identity crisis was also observed among the natives and this was the result of introducing English language into the uh, classrooms of India at the time of British Raj. Another point uh, which I would like to mention over here is uh, in the words of uh, Woods Dispatch, who said it in 1854 and uh, he declared that uh, the English language is to be the medium of instruction in the higher branches and the vernacular in the lower. English is to be taught where there is demand for it, but it is not to be substituted for the vernacular languages of the country. So, the system of grant in aid to be based on the principle of perfect religious neutrality. So, a sort of uh, resolution started taking place and this uh, resolution was in favor of uh, making English at a central uh, position also uh, to make it more neutral and uh, not to make it culturally or economically or identically biased. So, uh, though the emergence of English language was taking place as the medium of instruction, but there was also a demand that was rising and uh, keeping in mind the prospects and the controversies, uh, it was kept as a perfect religious neutrality. Now, we saw another important um, concept over uh, uh, there and uh, that was the conflict between the orientalist and uh, anglicist. English like you know is one of the important languages and at that time many people advocated the idea of western education in uh, the English language only. So, orientalist that led by Dr. H. H. Wilson and H. T. Princip advocated Sanskrit, Arabic and Persian as the medium of education. On the other hand, Anglicist led the Charles Trevelyan and Elphinstone advocated the imparting of western education. So, this was like uh, two concepts uh, controversing each other. So, Anglicist advocating the western education through the medium of English and Orientalist were mainly focused on bringing their culture, their language like Sanskrit, Arabic, Persian as their uh, medium of instruction and their education. Mahatma Gandhi however, was against of English education and uh, he said that the existing system of education is defective. Apart from its association with an utterly unjust government in three important matters, it is based upon foreign culture to the almost entire exclusion of indigenous culture. It ignores the culture of heart and the hand and confines itself simply to the head. And the third important aspect that uh, Mahatma Gandhi mentioned that the real education is impossible through a foreign medium. Why he said these statements? Because he wanted to. Uh, uh, aware the uh, people that uh, we are connected and we are associated with each other with the medium of language and that medium is the native language. So, native language makes you emotionally connected and especially this uh, native language played a great role in at the time of independence. So, there were slogans that were mainly used and those were native language. So, it was deliberately used. Why? Because uh, native language uh, emotionally captures your attention 
and therefore mahatma gandhi wanted to make people realize that our ultimate goal is to make people aware about the education go through the education and this is possible in the native language uh, it is not necessary to uh, go into english language and acquire the education in the medium itself uh, what is important is to understand our culture its heart and also go with the identity which india is uh, famous for now moving on to the next slide it says english in the post independence period so uh, before this let me tell you that one of the perplexing problems that we had to face soon after the uh, independence was the position uh, of english in the country and uh, the problem was the place of english in our educational setup so there was generally uh, uh many there were ma generally many groups and two groups were thinking that uh, about ab about the Indi one was thinking about the independent area of from angrezi hatao at one extreme to english as the sole medium of education at the other so there have been varying shades of opinion about the place and the function of english language and since india came out from the in, uh, from the in, uh, from the colonial rule it largely focused on progressing itself so all the colonial norms were under question and english one was one of its questions so we also saw that the hindi speaking areas um, have hardly any motivation for learning english and in the non hindi speaking area 33 english was welcomed heartily and there has been a certain degree of resistance in the learning of hindi so we experienced a rapid change uh, with respect to the place of english and uh, in some time english was recognized as an important global or international language essentially for professional employment and significantly a key component of the cultural capital of middle class indians so let me tell you that english is uh, considered a non indian language in the post independence period and um, it was recognized with this status in articles uh, 343 of 351 of the associate national official language for 15 years for all purposes for it was uh, used before by 3433 the official language act was passed in 1963 and it was amended in 1968 so the use of english as official language of the union must also not be discontinued until the non hindi states agree for such discontinuance article 346 provides that the uh, ol uh, of the union hindi or english shall be the ol for communication between the union and the state between the states also and that is mentioned in the constitution of india 1984 uh, in the page uh, from 108 to um, 110 now let's try to look up at uh, the words of v v yadi in 1977 he gave a clear distinction between a foreign language and second language and he recognized uh, these two important co components by uh, giving a certain definition he said that english as a foreign language refers to a situation where it is taught for certain specific purposes reading scientific works translation communication at certain levels for certain purposes only only so it is not considered a native language right because it is a non indian language as it was given by the, the as it was stated by the government of india however the use of english language is quite clear and english can be considered as a foreign language if it is uh, you know used for specific purposes like uh, scientific works like for um, uh, translating from one language to the other for communication at a certain platform or level and you know for specific purposes if you are doing it however english using it as a second language is quite different it 
refers to a situation where English is used widely for the purposes of administration, education and common link language. So, in India what do you think English is? Is it a foreign language or is it a second language? In my opinion English is considered a second language in India. Now, uh, the University Education Commission headed by Dr. Sir Pali Radha Krishnan in 1950-51 reported that the English language has been one of the potent factors in the development of unity in the country. So, despite of several debates and controversies with regard to the use and usage of English language, a large number of people were determining the value of the English in the education system of the country. They were understanding that the West is progressing and they have uh, been dominating over science and technology. So, in order to help our people to compete with them, it is important to acquire their language. So, the language which is connecting across the globe is English language. So, we cannot go away or we cannot escape it. It is just that we have to accept the fact that it plays an important role. So, the concept of nationality and the sentiment of nationalism are largely the gift of English language and literature to India. Uh, we cannot ignore the fact that um, many of the freedom fighters you know they, they studied and they got to know about the idea of liberalism, independence and then they came and you know uh, they, they started fighting for the uh, Indian independence. So, uh, English has played a significant role in many ways and it also acted as a bridge between the Britishers and India and this happened in the pre-independence period, but in the post-independence period what happened that it connected the world with Indians. So, the University Education Commission was in favor of it and it respects the nationality, the identity of other cultures and the languages and at the same time it emphasizes the importance of the English language. India's education system in 1964 and 66 has emphatically asserted that for the successful completion of the first degree course, a student should possess an educate command of English, be able to express himself with reasonable ease and felicity, understand lectures in it and avail himself of its literature. Therefore, educate emphasis will have to be paid on its study as a language right from the school stage. So, English was introduced in the educational system right from the beginning and it emphatically inserted that the learners should have uh, these parameters to get uh, into the education system and also uh, he or she should be fulfilling it. Right. So, uh, we have now understood this fact that English is nowhere ignored in the post independence period, it is uh, taken up into consideration and also education system of India has uh, largely uh, asserted uh, that uh, the successful uh, uh, education system English has to be introduced. Now, there were five major issues when it came to the implementation of English language at the secondary level and at the higher level. So, the first point as mentioned in this slide says that the number of languages to be taught at various levels of school education, because India is a place where many languages are spoken. Uh, we have Kashmiri language, we have Punjabi language, similarly uh, a lot of other languages like Gujarati, Malayalam, Odia, Tamil and so on. So, the question is not solved. If you are considering English language as the medium of instruction, as the medium of uh, administration, management and every other thing, then what place are we giving to our own Indian languages? Where would it go? So, this was one of the problems that we were facing through at that time. Then there were uh, other few problems, for example, the introduction of second and third languages. So, uh, is it like you know, uh, you learn the native language, then what would be the first language, what would be the second language, however, there is no concept as such the third language, but by third here I mean 
uh, that uh, what would be uh, the uh, criteria of uh, learning 1, 2 and 3 and 4 languages like how a learner can do that way and what place would we give to such language. Then uh, what role and position would be we giving to English language? Will we be considering English as uh, foreign or, or as a second language? So, the place and role of Hindi was also argued and it is still in debate. So, uh, not just that English and Hindi uh, is there, but other regional languages are also there. And there are many languages in India itself that are prone to get extinct. So, what about their promotion? What about their conservation? That all were discussed if we are giving that much of a space to the English language. And the last issue that is discussed over here is about the teaching of Sanskrit and minor languages in a school. Like I said, what about those uh, languages which are uh, very uh, rare here? and uh, they are being spoken less. So, how about the Sanskrit language which was widely used in the ancient time, but at this moment of time it is uh, getting close to dead, but uh, with the uh, 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 with the advent of conservation policy and other initiatives, we are now regaining the value of Sanskrit. So, uh, moving to the next slide there came the formula and this formula is widely known as the three language formula. This three language formula brought the solution of the key issues that we were facing at the time of post independence period. And uh, like we had the problem of giving place to English language in India, also about our concerns with regard to the regional languages, our own languages, our native languages. So, this was solved out by the three language formula. So, when the child grows up and uh, the child is exposed to a certain kind of language in which he starts calling his mother as mama, papa, dada, nani, nana and so on. So, uh, this uh, takes us to the child uh, learning the native language. However, the first language is quite different. First language is either the mother tongue can be the mother tongue also or the regional language. So, for example, if this child is born and brought up in Hindi language and he is living in Odisha and he goes out of his house to buy grocery, but at the grocery store he needs to learn the Odia language in order to communicate. So, the Odia language would be the first language for him. The second language is in Hindi speaking states, it will be other modern languages or English. So, in non-Hindi speaking states, it will be Hindi or English. Therefore, now this child uh, taking up the same example, this child goes to school. In the school, English is taught as a medium of instruction. So, this child will learn, consciously learn the English language this use and usage. Therefore, the second language will be considered English in the context of this child. And what is third language? In English, uh, in Hindi speaking states, it will be English or a modern Indian language. In the non-Hindi speaking state, it will be English or a modern Indian language. So, in this way, the three language formula solved many key issues that we were facing at the time of post-independence period. So, uh, with this three language formula, there came some components with regard to the uh, language politics in India. So, in the constituent assembly, Hindi was basically voted as the official language of the union by a single vote. At the same time, it uh, gave states the liberty to independently decide their official uh, language. Right. So, however, it provided that the use of English language would continue for 15 years or more and after 15 years parliament can enact a law to provide for continued use of English language for specified purposes. But the constitution also asked the government to appoint a commission at the end of 5 to 10 years respectively to make recommendation with regard to progressive use of the Hindi language. 
so as the uh, end of the 15 years drew uh, closer there were widespread protest in the mainly southern states particularly against the promotion of hindi language keeping in mind the protest official language act which was enacted in 1963 provided for continued use of english alongside hindi indefinitely and then the three language formula was involved uh, to uh, help the teaching system across varying regions in the country however it was not uniform Whereas, Hindi was the general medium of instruction in the north regional languages and English was the medium of instruction in other parts of the country. So, this led to chaos and created difficulties for interstate communication. However, in order to uniformize uh, the system in 1968, uh, the new education policy drived a middle path called the three language formula which I have just demonstrated first, second and the third. So, mainly uh, it is three functions were there and it was ought to serve accommodating group identity, secondly to affirming national unity and the third increasing administrative efficiency. And uh, incidentally, the NPE of 1986 made no change in the 1968 policy on the three language formula and the promotion of Hindi uh, and repeated it verbatim. So, what has been the progress of three language formula? Since education is a state subject, the implementation of the formula lay with the states. Only a few states had adopted the formula in uh, its principle. So, language uh, formula was uh, considered in only few states, not all states were uh, taken up, uh, taking up into consideration. In many of the Hindi speaking states, Sanskrit became the third language instead of any modern Indian language, preferably in South uh, Indian language, but this defeated the purpose of the three language formula to promote interstate connections. So, interstate connections were mainly important at this point of time. In non Hindi speaking states such as Tamil Nadu, a two language formula was adopted and did not implement the three language formula. So, given India's linguistic diversity, it became a task, arduous task to choose one language while not hurting the sentiments of speakers of countless other languages that uh, were important especially in the post independence period. So, the consensus in the constituent assembly to keep Hindi as the official language and English as the associate official language arrived after much discussion to give the uh, states uh, liberty to independently decide their official language. However, the teaching system across various regions in the country was not uniform. So, whereas Hindi was the general medium of instruction in the north, regional languages and English were the media of instruction in other parts. Therefore, this led to chaos and created difficulties for interstate communication and therefore, in order to uniformize the system, the 1968, the new educational policy drived a middle path and called the three language formula, wherein Hindi, English and the regional languages would be taught to students from the secondary stage onwards. It was mainly developed to ensure proper inclusion and progression of regional languages and also to conserve these languages and promote these. Hence, the formula was a compromise between the demands of the various pressure groups and could be called a masterly if imperfect solution to a complicated problem. So, as per the policy, state governments were to promote the study of modern Indian language preferably one of the southern languages apart from Hindi and English in the 
Hindi speaking states. So, in the non Hindi speaking states, Hindi would be studied along with the regional language, the mother tongue and English, and the associate official language of the union. However, a policy cannot succeed until it is properly executed. So, while this policy was being followed in the south, northern states did nothing for the promotion of southern languages. So, this new education policy, especially of 2019, envisions an objective similar to university education commission that happened in 1950 and of NEP in 1965. And in fact, in 2017 also, a presidential order stated the center that it should draw a policy to make Hindi a compulsory subject in addition to the other languages. And therefore, with the presentation of the NEP in the parliament, the debate on this was reignited and primarily because the South Indian st state saw it as an attempt to impose Hindi over them and transform it into the national language, this is problematic because at least in 20 out of 29 states, Hindi is not the natural language. In this way, the debate over three language formula kept on continuing. Now, we will study the prospects of English language in India. What are its scope and how can we implement uh, the English language in order to make our citizens better and close to education. So, first is that as you know English is a global language, it will help you connect with the people around the globe. It will facilitate trade, commerce, science and technology learning and so on. So, global language is there and uh, English is also known as lingua franca. Since it is a connecting language, it is facilitating a range of opportunities for employment and for connecting. The other thing is employability. So, uh, to overcome any barrier in, uh, employ, uh, in employability, you need to learn English language and it is largely preferred be it in India or outside in India. And in case suppose, uh, and in case you go to uh, let us say France. And uh, you need, you may need not to learn the French language. However, if you know the English language, you will be e able to easily survive there. So, uh, not just that uh, you will be able to survive that, but also you will be able to compete there and you will be able to participate in the work environment. So, work employability matters and work mainly uh, promotes uh, English education and it facilitates English environment uh, in varying ways. Also, uh, if we look up at the prospect of English language in India, we will get to know that uh, for the social, economic and political welfare, English plays an important role. So, if you remember like I said, if you want to connect to a different state and you do not know each other's language, you can connect easily through the language that is English. Also, it provides economic benefit, a large number of information be it investment, trade or shares or any kind of uh, information that is facilitated either on television or on newspaper, the key terms are of mainly English language. And also of political welfare because of the representations that come from varying backgrounds and varying states. So, one language which is connecting from one state, one country to the other that is political welfare and that will facilitate it by the English language. And also if you want to raise up any issue of India to other places and if you have any problem with that, you can always reach out uh, to the um, to the, to your authorities and these authorities can communicate the problems uh, at a larger level, can raise up your issues uh, at international platforms. So, what is the link language here? It is the English language. Also for intercultural communication or transnational communication with other countries. So, cultural exchanges take place and these cultural exchanges uh, brings people close to each other. So, if you are sitting in United States of America and your friend is sitting in India or you are sitting in India and your friend is sitting in France, which language is uh, uh, bringing you closer? It is 
English language. Therefore, for intercultural communication, you can attain this task as well. And also, you can share each other's culture as well in different countries. Like you can go to your friend uh, in the United States and can talk about Indian culture and can promote Indian values. Similarly, your friend can come to India and can talk about American values. Therefore, the interconnection takes place and the two parties that are involved there in the exchange of culture find promotion of their culture as well as their heritage and they come closer and ultimately promote peace in the world. Now, the next point as it is mentioned in the prospect says that for educational system, science and technology, arts and humanities and social sciences, trade and commerce, English is imp important. So, be it any institute, be it um, uh, a s institute which lies in northern India or the southern India or in the central India, all kinds of books, materials, instructions that take place happen in, in uh, happen in English only. So, for education system, English is highly essential and it is extremely important. Therefore, you know that uh, the essential concepts be it mathematics or science or astronomy or um, uh, let us say um, accountancy and also uh, so on, they all are provided in English language. Also, it is the holistic development of solutions. Therefore, it gives you the opportunity to uh, go through the issues and challenges and face the world with a high level of articulation. Now, I would like to conclude this session by mentioning few important key points. The first point is that the English language was introduced to India during the British regime. Earlier, before the British period, we were ruled by the Mughal emperors and Mughal emperors were invaded by the Britishers. So, what Mughal emperors brought? They brought the Persian language and culture over here and uh, this uh, replacement of the language brought many problems to India and also they were not uh, ready to submit their language and culture because English was introduced uh, with the perception of dominating and also for invading the people. However, it uh, provided certain uh, uh, connection and what kind of connection did it provide? It provided uh, the medium uh, through which the Britishers and the India uh, were connected. So, Indians were having the language to communicate the issues to the Britishers and at the same time Britishers were also communicating uh, to Indians through the English language. So, though it was introduced for the uh, domination purpose, but it was also used for varying purposes and at that time several missionary schools were introduced and education system were evolving. So, therefore, English language, the western education were getting emphasized, the ang anglicist and the orientalist were coming up with their perspectives and opinions. Then the fight of uh, 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 freedom was taking place, the pre-independence period was, uh, was, was in a surge of um, uh, was in a surge of getting independence at that time. So, a lot of changes were taking place and revolutions were coming into being. English was uh, there at uh, the pre independence period and even during the development of India after the post independence, English was playing an essential role. The next point as it is mentioned in this slide says that majority of the Indians consider the English language as a threat to their culture and native languages. Like I said, it they thought that uh, um, English language is going to uh, is going to dominate over them. Also, uh, their children would be um, deviated from their uh, religions, uh, fr from their religious and their cultural uh, identities. So, they were not uh, initially in favor of the English language. However, with time people started realizing the value and importance of English language. So, after the liberalization and global industrialization that uh, resulted in the late 20th century, 
the quest for learning English language gained momentum. So, when people started coming together, uh, they, they exchanged uh, uh, their commerce and also cultural exchanges took place. So, the learning of English language gained popularity and people essentially gained momentum in learning English. Now, parents wanted their children to study in the English language schools only. Why? Because there was a huge scope and a lot of opportunities could be facilitated if the child is getting English education. Therefore, the momentum was highly gained at this point of time. Now, as it is mentioned in the slide, English was introduced as a foreign language. However, it is now graded as a second language. So, in the post independence world, English was mainly considered as a foreign language and people were not uh, in favor of implementing the English as a medium of instruction. However, keeping in mind the demand and the need, uh, people started thinking again on the use of English language and they implemented it as second language. So, there is a difference between the foreign language and the second language. So, second language provides a broader scope as compared to the foreign language and it is mainly used for trade, commerce, administration, educational purpose and so on. So, English is being widely used for the purposes of administration, education and as a common linked language. Like you know that after it graded as a uh, uh, second language, it was now commonly used for varying purposes. Now, people in political lives are communicating with each other in English language. Now, the medium of instruction is English language and also uh, the connection uh, that is made up is also through English language. Therefore, it is it was broadly used in different situations and different context. English is now the language of communication, science and technology, arts and social science and trade and commerce. Now, the borders which are there that uh, segregates the countries are being minimized. Now, uh, the differences are not being seen. It happens because of the language. So, language is not merely concerned to only textbooks or a certain kind of material or a specific use, but it is a spread over every domain. And uh, the language plays an important role in our progression, in our development. If we do not learn the language, we would somehow be putting ourselves back. And since India is in a place where it needs to get developed and it needs to have several economic, political and social progression. And in order to progress further and faster, it is important to think and learn what others are doing. So, English will play an effective role in this and therefore, the role of English is not consigned to the classroom only or the English subject only, but it is widespread and largely inculcated across varying disciplines such as the science, technology, arts, commerce and its uh, importance should not be considered as something which is not valued. Its importance is very high and one should know how to use it and how to teach it as well. So, with this idea there comes the idea of English language teaching. English language teaching will help the learners to, uh, uh, to facilitate language to their learners. Therefore, the teacher and the learner uh, relationship will be built up on, the strategy will be there to facilitate learning process and also a kind of development will take place to make learning and teaching faster and easier. Here are the references and in the next session we will cover up an important topic and we will talk about the introduction to the English language and we will also study the several dialects. We will talk about received pronunciation, we will also know about the general Indian English and its controversies and some other important prospects that are there. With this we have come to an end of this session, I hope you enjoyed it, thank you very much for joining.
Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.